Like a lot of people, I'm a worrier. But a visit to the doctor a year or so ago gave me a new name for it. Anxiety, which worried me even more. But I was a mess of stress and the good doctor prescribed me these. I took the Xanax and it would give me a sense of calmness and that everything was going to be okay. So I took a few and to be honest, they helped. Xanax was great. It was me but with the edges taken off. A benzo is basically initially, only initially, it's a duvet, it's a quilt in pill form. When I was prescribed Xanax a while back, I'll admit I was anxious. Anxious about work, anxious about planning my wedding. But modern life leaves lots of us feeling panicked and none of us likes to feel out of control. But what happens when a short-term happy pill turns into a long-term addiction? And what other ways are out there to help deal with the anxiety caused by the stresses of a busy life? Because being able to cope calmly and clear-headedly with life's everyday pressures, I think that's what every woman wants. Last summer, I was a contestant on MasterChef. The experience blasted me far outside my comfort zone, and it was quite honestly the most anxiety-ridden period of my life. To understand why I ever needed to medicate my anxiety, I needed to understand what's in me that triggers a stress reaction. So I forced myself to go back to the kitchen. God, I feel a bit sick already. I uh, have the gear on, I have this headset. They give you a headset to shout at you. Shouting in person isn't enough, but it looks like gastronomic bedlam out there. This is what anxiety is like, and it's only gonna get worse. It's different for everyone, but this is what anxiety is like for me. And is that a mic? That is a mic, but you won't need to talk back. I might. You might. I might possibly. say, no, chef, I can't do that right okay. now. I'm busy. Yeah, terrible. Cool. I won't get away with that, will I? No. So can you put me on something simple like washing lettuce? It'll be fine. Here goes nothing. Okay, cool. Nice one. Do you have any Xanax on you, buddy? No, I don't, no. Okay. <laughs> First trigger, the presence of controlling personalities, when I can feel all my control leaving me. How are you? I'll be happier just watching you on. Yes, you're a bit lazy. Then. I'm not lazy, I just suffer from anxiety. And some top choice. Second trigger is feeling inadequate and doubting I'm up to the job. Now, did you season that? Did I season the... No, I didn't. Not too much now. Oh, I've got something wrong already. Third trigger, feeling that I'm not measuring up to other people's expectations of me. Sorry, Chef. Can I dried lamb and a skin one? Yes, Chef. I need to move, move a bit faster now. It's starting to get busy, so... Sorry. More cheese. With orders bombing into the earpiece, this would be a pressurised environment for anyone. But like a lot of women, it's not the pressure to keep up with productivity demands that's my stressor. It's that constant fear of not being good enough. Oh no! I've done the wrong one. Get another glass quickly. Outside in the restaurant, I could feel the weight of expectation. There were people out there whose whole night's pleasure was reliant on the food I sent out being gorgeous. Okay, palatable. Another one now. Yes, Holy moly. The weight of other people's expectations. That's what really drives me to try and shed the load and reach for a mood calmer. In this case, a chip. And God, did that make me feel good. Sorry. Sorry. This is my idea of hell, I have to say. It's hot. Yeah, I just, now maybe I'm just I'm out of my depth and I feel anxious when I don't know what I'm doing and you yeah. obviously know what you're doing. Yeah. But you're obviously a really calm person, naturally. No, no, not naturally. No, it'd be very stressed inside, but you have to keep it inside because you're in front of customers. But as someone who claims to be naturally stressed, do you not find this makes it worse? No, I used to suffer with anxiety, though, um, as oh, I said. Really? Yeah, I used to, used to. And then as soon as I came into the kitchen, like, you vent. So all your stress, you're so focused on one job and one task that you just... So you take it out in the Blackberry Cooley? I take it out, I take it out in my Banafis that just went off, yeah. yeah. You look amazing. Yeah. Like, I'm going to get out of your way and go and cry. Yeah. Thanks, no, it's not that bad. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, my God. I've only stopped for a toilet break, allegedly. I have to go back. In the period 2010 to 2011, 6.5% of all Irish adults said they had used sedatives and tranquilizers over the previous year. In 2006 to 2007, that figure was 4.7%. I wondered, could women be more susceptible to anxious feelings than men? Is there something about modern Irish life that makes it difficult for women to cope? Do you think anxiety affects more women than it does men? I think women probably 
talk about these things more. I think men may have ways, perhaps sometimes, of physically working off some of those kind of stresses. It's not that it's harder to be a woman than it is to be a man, I and mean, I think everyone's got their own worries nowadays, but certainly for women of my age, in, in their late 30s, there's, there's a lot of pressure to kind of do it all and to have the but career see, and the family suppose, and to look good. And you, the word you use, you see, people will use the word anxiety. Men are probably more inclined to use the word stress. Now, there probably isn't actually a huge amount between either of them, you know, whereas stress has a more manly sense to it. Yeah. Um, so men would do a stress management course, but actually the core is exactly the same yeah. as an anxiety management course. Because we do, I mean, we all have stress and we need a certain amount of stress in our lives mm. to function. Mm. But I mean, it's when, I guess, when, when does it become a problem? There's a certain amount of stress and anxiety that actually improves performance. So if somebody is sitting an exam or running in a race or whatever, they need to have a certain amount of getting keyed up and ready to go. But at a particular level then, if the anxiety exceeds a particular level, an individual's performance goes down and they go to pieces. But it's at the point that any individual feels that they can't manage and that they need help. I think that there is a place for preparations like benzodiazepines, but very strict and very short term and very specific. And there are certain situations where I think prescribing benzodiazepines, if somebody has a history of depression and if it's lasted for several weeks, if not months, if their um, biological function is um, completely upset, in other words, if they've lost their appetite, lost weight, lost concentration, giving a benzodiazepine or preparation like Valium will blunt or pause the, what's going on, but it won't actually treat it. Benzodiazepines are a sedative, a downer drug that reduces anxiety, stress and encourages sleep. They can also ease the come down from uppers like ecstasy, cocaine and speed. Doctors and psychiatrists say that in moderation, benzos can play a positive role in dealing with a short-term moment of anxiety or crisis, a bit like a stiff drink. They can also be a useful quick fix part of a combination of therapies where there are deeper problems to be addressed. But sometimes, like alcohol, benzos can be used inappropriately and turn into a long-term addiction that is really hard to shake. When I took Xanax, I really didn't appreciate the risks of long-term use and addiction, and I reckon there are lots of women out there in the same boat. I went to meet Jenny Marr, who was prescribed benzos when she began having violent panic attacks after the birth of her son, Jack. What does a panic attack feel like for you? Um, first of all, you're anxious, so you, you know, you feel, well, I feel nauseous. Um, I feel, I could be vomiting, diarrhea, I, my heart is palpitations. Um, I feel like I'm going to pass out, I'm sweating, my insides are shaking. Um, and where you, if, you, if I was out, I'd just have to get up and leave where I am. Um, I suppose come back to the comfort of where I'm comfortable in, which is obviously home. Um, but I've often had one being at home as well. So when you recognise what, what these attacks were, Jenny, I mean, did you almost self-diagnose them? Or did you actually go to a, a doctor and have them tell you once and well, yes, these are panic attacks? Well, I left it for about a year after I had Jack, and then I went to the doctor and um, told him how I was feeling. And he said, yeah, you are suffering with depression, uh, with secondary anxiety. So the anxiety is, is part, obviously, of the depression. Um, and then the panic attacks, I suppose, come hand in hand with that. Where does Xanax fit into this now, Jenny? They're there for when you are when you are anxious, but I couldn't take a Xanax every time I feel anxious because sure, I'd be popping them four or five times a day if that was the case. And me personally, I can't function when I take a Xanax. Um, if I have a Xanax, I have to go to bed and lie down because they just totally throw me. Um, I wouldn't be able to drive, I wouldn't be able to look after the children. You mentioned driving, like I didn't realise you're not supposed to drive on Xanax. No, definitely not, because they, they, they I suppose they fog you, you know, that way yeah. they re they're a relaxer, they're there to relax you. So I'll only take Xanax after I have a panic attack, if it's been a very bad panic attack. When was the last bad one you had? Was it two um, years ago? No, two weeks ago. Two I've been getting ago. them more, more in the last six months than I ever have. Um, I had one, a really bad one about two weeks ago. Jack had a, an appointment in Crumlin one morning at nine o'clock and I do all his appointments with him. 
and it, if I have one in the morning I wake up at 10 to 6 and I know straight away that it's there and of course I was in I was vomiting diarrhea and I just woke Vinny up and he knew I suppose from experience from looking at me that that it was happening and he had to take the day off work and bring Jack to the to the hospital because I just I, I couldn't I physically could not get out to bring him. Jenny are you aware of um, a lot of Xanax use amongst your family and friends I mean do you know other people who are using it? Yeah, I'd know people that would take it on a daily basis. Um, I suppose some people just to get them through the day, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be spoken about. Um, like I'd know it's there, but but it wouldn't be a topic that you'd sit down and, and chat about or yeah. say, "Can I have can I have one off you?" or that kind of thing. Did you feel any level of embarrassment at all when no. you started taking them? No, I never did. For the simple reason, I'd have you know, I'd have experience with some family members um, that have suffered with depression. So for me, it's always been an open an open forum. But I have picked up on people that don't suffer with it or have never suffered with it. They don't know how to react to you and it's not an ignorance with them it's just because it's not spoken about so they don't know how to react to to what you're going through because they have not they haven't had any experience in it and because it's not spoken about well if it's a broken arm they'll say how's your arm healing but people are also afraid you know well, how, how how are um just oh, i'll just go and stand over mm -hmm. i don't know how to phrase it mm -hmm. or the head how are you yeah Glad. okay that's good and then that's Phew, it. she yes. didn't burst into tears exactly. oh, thank God. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> that's exactly what it is 64% of Irish benzodiazepine users report taking the drug on a daily basis. At one time, like a lot of women, I wouldn't have thought twice about popping a Xanax to get me through a hectic day. But now that I know the risks, I decided to go back to the medicine cabinet for one last time to see if the effects were really worth it. Well, it's been two years or thereabouts since I last took one of these little guys, a Xanax pill, or felt the need to. Um, this is a leftover few pills from my own prescription a few years ago, so it's all above board, they are mine. Um, I'm gonna take one now, and in about half an hour, I've got an appointment with a psychiatrist, so he's gonna tell me exactly what they do when I take one, uh, and where that anxiety goes. Here it goes. So I was on my way to benzodiazepine sedation, hopefully for the very last time, and strictly in the name of research. Benzodiazepines begin to affect you after 10 to 15 minutes. The effects last up to six hours. I wanted to find out how these pills worked. What effect do they have on my brain? To do that, I was going to let the drug take effect and have consultant psychiatrist Dr. Brendan Kelly scientifically explain what I was experiencing. Brendan, about uh, 30, 40 minutes ago, I took a low dose benzodiazepine. Um, and I won't deny I'm feeling quite calm. It was quite a stressful morning and it's quite a nice feeling. But can you tell me, what's that actually doing to me? Like, what's it done to my brain and my body to actually have that effect? Well, to understand what benzodiazepines do, we need to understand about the brain. The brain is composed of 100 billion brain cells, and they're all sending chemical messages to each other all the time. What a benzodiazepine does is it affects one of those brain chemicals called GABA. Now, GABA is a natural calmer down, if you will. It calms down brain cells and reduces their communication with each other. And the benzodiazepine that you took today is helping GABA do that job. It's a little bit like placing a big blanket right over your brain and calming it that little bit. Does it actually do any damage to the brain? Does it affect the brain negatively in any way? The first thing is it will stop working for you. If you feel calm now, in future weeks, you're going to need more benzodiazepine to produce that same feeling. And by about six months, you would have habituated completely. That means that within that time, uh, it will no longer have the calming effect. And to get the same calming effect, which you will really want to get again, you will need to take a higher dose or take it more frequently. Also, what the tablet does is it sends you a message. Um, by taking it, you're telling yourself that to cope with everyday stresses, you need a tablet. Now that's a very powerful message to send yourself, and it's a disempowering message. It, it, it tells you that you need assistance to get through from day to day, when the chances are the assistance you need 
uh, probably isn't uh, to be found in any tablet. There are other ways of overcoming this kind of anxiety. And what about other things you might not think of, like driving a car? I mean, is it safe to drive a car on benzodiazepines? Taking these medications uh, calms down all aspects of your, of your brain function. So you will be less well able to drive a car. You will be at increased risk of having an accident. You will be less well able to do the day-to-day -day things that you want to do. You may feel calmer and more able to do them. However, your abilities are diminished. Um, so I would have you know, extreme concern if, for example, you were flying an aeroplane after you had taken benzodiazepines. Well, I wouldn't be flying a plane because I don't have a pilot's license. So with or without uh, benzos, I wouldn't be doing that. And what about the other effects? I mean, I know, I know that I can feel now it's making me feel very calm, but what about the other effects? how it might affect um, somebody's day-to-day -day job. Like if you were a teacher or for someone like me who's um, hopefully <laughs> trying to be creative, um, how would it affect that side of me? The benzodiazepine will make you feel calmer, but it will diminish your initiative and your creativity and your ability to do all of the things you describe. It, you know, the reduction in anxiety may assist somewhat with those tasks, but this sort of blanket, this silencing blanket that's that you're putting over your brain will diminish your initiative and your originality and your creativity to a significant extent. And it, 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 it's very regrettable to see because you're paying a very high price for a short-term, short-lived, uh, minor reduction in anxiety that could most likely be achieved through other means. Okay. Hearing that I'd just taken a pill that would diminish my ability to do my job would normally terrify me, but at that moment, I was feeling too numbed to be bothered. Benzodiazepines may lose their effect as sleeping pills after only two weeks of continuous use. They no longer control anxiety after four months of regular use. But as women all over the world flood the web with stories of benzo addiction and withdrawal, how have Irish women coped with their effects? Just feeling like the most pathetic creature in the world. You do have to fight against it yeah. because it is very addictive. I'm Maya Dunphy, and for a short while in 2011, I took benzodiazepine sedatives because my life was busy and my coping skills were low. The thing is, I still have stress in my life, but we all do. It's part of being human. But yet I still have these in my medicine cabinet. The leftover pills from an old Xanax prescription never finished. But yet I never threw them out. And sometimes I wonder, is there a subconscious comfort in knowing that they're there? Because even if I never take another one, I know that my crutch is in the cupboard. You get in the shop. Dr. 
Dublin single mum of three, Pearl Marr, battled a mounting dependency on benzodiazepines two years ago. Pearl, you've been through the ringer, but you're out the other side now. Go back to the beginning. Tell us how this began for you. I had my twins in August, almost three years ago. And I suppose I started over the course of a few weeks feeling very low myself. I went to my doctor and I told my doctor how low I was feeling. So she said to me that I have postnatal depression. And I'd say about six weeks after that, um, my suicidal thoughts and what have you started to increase a lot more and, and worsen. And I ended up going into hospital. So they put me on Seroquel, like tranquilizers, like Xanax. And I was on two a day. And they also put me on sleeping tablets as well. And it, it did aid my recovery at the time. I've taken Xanax up during moments of anxiety as well. And you do have that feeling of that you're just not able to cope with that day. And when you take it, it just it takes the edges off. And there's no denying it's a very powerful drug. Mm -hmm. But certainly for me, I felt that I wasn't then firing on all cylinders. Did you feel that as well? That yeah. it did take the edges off your nerves, but also off you a little yeah. bit? I'd always make sure like that there was someone around with me, help me with the kids as well, because I felt like I wasn't completely myself. Were you ever addicted, do you think? There was a lot of times where I did have to fight and say, oh God, I, I think today I will take a Xanax today to get me through the day. And you do have to fight against it yeah. because it is very addictive. Did you just know they were in the cupboard? It, it was a sense of, of an emergency. Yeah, they knowing that they, they were in the cupboard exactly like a crutch. And like if I'd have a really bad day, I'd take one. I never took one, more than one in the day. Can you tell me how you feel before you take one and then how you feel afterwards? What are the actual effects? I used to have very bad panic attacks and anxiety attacks and I felt like I couldn't kind of control myself and I would be shaking. I felt like my heart was going to burst out my chest and just knowing that I had a Xanax there and I took the Xanax and it would give me a sense of calmness and that everything was going to be okay and you know I'm in control of my body now and my thoughts. Most recent data from the Health Research Board has shown that the annual number of treated cases reporting benzodiazepines as a problem substance increased by more than 63% between 2003 and 2008. I once took sedatives to cope, but these days I'm more interested in finding ways to de-stress naturally to avoid taking pills. And I'll admit I'm a lifelong gym dodger, but I kept on hearing about the powerful psychological effects of running. Running, not running away. At the end of a hard day in the office, it turns you back into a normal person. Does it? Well, for me it does. If you go out and do your hour of whatever you like to do and you come back in, and then the people that you love still love you after that. You don't get the same sense of achievement from just going home, just yeah, popping yeah. a pill or going home. Like when you actually go out and try and do an adventure race or travel on the feeling afterwards is amazing. And it, it comes back when you think of it like a couple of months later or whatever. Spare you on to do another one. Yeah, yeah you could, definitely. Yeah. It's addictive, really addictive. If you could bottle and sell the feeling at the end of a race or at the end of a class that you do, you'd be a millionaire. It was obvious that these women were getting much more from running than I ever got from numbing my brain with benzos. It was just a pity you can't cure anxiety by watching. A lot of women now are drinking too much or taking Xanax as a way to beat stress and clear their heads. and. Exercise is an obvious one, isn't it? I know. Yeah, it really is. A lot of my friends, for instance, would even have the really in the last kind of couple of months have really started doing exercise, whereas before to de-stress they would have just said, "Let's all go out, let's go in the piss again." So ideally, you want to get down. Oh come on! No, you can. You just did it. Yeah, but then your knees go over. Yeah, so it's, like, it's really starting to kind of come into just like women's mindset as well that they actually feel better after doing exercise. So yeah, it's really good. It's and you were saying that some women are reluctant to go or worry that that even cause more anxiety. Do you yeah, think? yeah. Why is that? So it's kind of like it's kind of like a I suppose a circle of death, like a kind of catch twenty two, where they just they're anxious, they get they get anxious about you know not looking great, not feeling great. Uh, the answer is to do exercise, but then they start getting worried about doing exercise because they need to go to a gym and then they're like but I don't look good to go to a gym so for any woman who is feeling like everything's getting on top of her kids work everything in life do you recommend exercise 100% exercise well I'm not going to pretend I've run this I'm just run over the finish line <laughs> yeah, let's do you want to join me sprint. okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> In the corner of my eye, I spotted number 258, a glamorous blonde in an Irish jersey who romped home as third fastest woman. When did you take up running? Three months ago. Three months ago, and before that, what did you do to de 
any stress? Um, I've made a lot of hurdles, like most. And would you be a worrier? Would you be someone who gets anxious about life, or does sport just keep you grounded? Sport keeps you occupied. Like I don't have time to be stressful, or like I don't have time to have any stress really. Like that's brilliant. See, so many women either they drink to de-stress, or they take Xanax or something, yeah. but. I don't see the point. And like you just find a hobby that you love and then just go at it and enjoy it. And what do you do for a living? I'm an aircraft engineer. Oh wow! So that's a stressful job. It can be, yeah. You're put under pressure all the time, but you work better when you're put under pressure. So. Yeah. Well, you want somebody who's in good shape. You're fixing the planes. Yeah. Oh, look at your legs. I'm so jealous. If I stand here and pretend they're mine, that's what I'd look like with legs like that. She's screaming for relief and she knows where to find it now. Developed in the 1960s, benzodiazepines replaced barbiturates as the world's most prescribed sedative drug. Barbs, tritely dubbed Mother's Little Helpers, came with a serious risk of overdose. Benzos, by comparison, were seen as far safer. They were billed as wonder drugs. You know, I can remember the medical rep saying, oh, there, there's no side effects like barbiturates with these. They're non-addictive, they're safe and no overdose. I can hear all that even yeah. nearly 40 years later. But there is a cohort of middle-aged, late middle-aged women in particular who we deal with who do have problems with these drugs. And there's a sense of urgency and insistence when they need them. And the need and urgency comes from the fact that they don't want to be without them because if they ever been without them for a day or two, they know the withdrawal symptoms are going to start setting in. You can get tremor, sweating, nausea, vomiting, delusional and paranoid feelings and so on. And often they mimic the symptoms which brought you to benzodiazepines in the first place. So it makes you reach for them again. Yeah, and I believe I'm only seeing the tip of an absolutely enormous iceberg. There's a lot of people out there for various reasons are living with this harm day in, day out. Proprietary names for benzodiazepines include Librium, Valium, Xanax, Ativan, Restoral, Rohypnol. Street names include Jellies, Blueies, Sleepers, Moggies, Roofies, Downers, Eggs, Rugby Balls, D5s, D10s, Roach. So what does it feel like when the negative side of benzos kicks in? Writer Doodle Canelli has experienced both sides of benzos and feels that their easy access is part of the problem. A benzo is basically, initially, only initially, uh, it, it's, a, it's a duvet, it's a quilt in pill form. When you first take it, it's just like that <gasps> is gone. It's yeah. just, uh, you know, and it's so, it's, uh, it's deceptive. It's almost like the empathy drug. It's like if somebody sees you going through a tough time, they'll say, oh, I, I have a Xanax or a Valium, do you want one? I mean, certainly I have, I know, I won't say any of their names, but I have friends and colleagues who always have a few Xanax in the bottom of their handbags. Yeah, it, it's yeah, almost yeah. like they just offer it to yeah. you. People will say, oh, I have a number for a taxi driver who who always has like a hundred Xanax on him. A taxi driver? Yeah, or there's a certain doctor you can go to who's guaranteed to prescribe it to you, or... What? Yeah. The doctor? I know there's some doctors that are relaxed, but the taxi driver, wow. I think Jiggle, people just don't know how addictive it is. They're treating it like paracetamol and, I, you know, I've heard very few people who, who understand how addictive it can be. I think people think that they will become emotionally dependent on it. I don't think they understand the physical dependence, that you will go through physical withdrawal. And do you remember what some of the symptoms were, how you felt? I can remember sitting at my kitchen table in front of my laptop and even the tiniest sounds, like the ding of a, of a new email coming in, I thought my head was going to explode. Withdrawal symptoms can begin between one and seven days after your last dose and can last for several months. Symptoms include anxiety, confusion and serious convulsions, dubbed benzo fits. Benzodiazepines are for short-term use only, so anyone who's been using them for years and years and years has more than likely developed an addiction, whether or not they, they want to admit it. 
That person who's been using them for years is in serious trouble, and they ought not to be uh, discontinuing them without careful medical supervision. The withdrawal effects from Xanax after long-term use, um, you will see very, very horrific withdrawal effects unless it's carefully medically managed. But in the short term, um, it, it's a wonderful medication for a few days. And we talk about addiction, Stephen. I mean, alcohol, compulsive eating, gambling, mm -hmm. these things are all readily available. But when we talk about something like benzodiazepines and Xanax, they have to be prescribed. You can't just walk into a supermarket and, and buy a, you know, a box of them. Do you think they're being overprescribed? It seems, you know, I know in my years at the Rutland Center, you'd hear wild stories about the amount of benzodiazepine medication that some people were getting. And you say, how is this possible? Is it because the patient's running from GP to GP to GP to GP? Is it because they're buying uh, drugs that were stolen from a pharmaceutical company and they're buying them on the street? Yeah, sometimes. But sometimes that individual, say a, a middle-aged housewife, is going back to her, the same GP over and over and over and over again. Tranquilizer ben benzodiazepine addiction has a very powerful grip. Um, it, it, it's not an easy addiction to get over. It's not just a psychological addiction. It, 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 when people go through withdrawal, if they're not properly medically managed through the withdrawal process, the withdrawal effects can be brutal. So sometimes people feel like, well, better be careful about trying to get them off it. They'll probably just go on it, back on it again. And if they misuse, stop too abruptly, there'll be terrible side effects. So it's a very serious problem and it needs to be carefully attended to. I wondered if doctors were contributing to the problem. Do they see quick fix medication as the be all and end all, rather than part of a combination of therapies? Are they too casual in handing out these pills? Are Irish GPs over prescribing benzos to women like me? Do you think that drugs like Xanax are being overprescribed? Benzodiazepines can certainly have short term usage. Um, benzodiazepines can be like stun guns. They will okay, stop yeah. something for a while, but they won't actually. Because, of course, the problem. they're not like an antibiotic for an infection that That's are going right. to cure it. They will manage anxiety for a given period of time, but once the period of time is up and the preparation is worn off, it will come back. Sooner or later, either the pills are going to run out or. It's going to be, something's going to be or unpaused. The pills, and or the pills are, big, are, are likely to become ineffective at that dose. To get the same level of calm, you're going to need to press the button harder. I was interested in what Irish GPs themselves had to say on the issue. So I went to meet ICGP representative Dr. Ida DeLarghi, herself a practicing family doctor. Dr. DeLarghi, the issue around benzodiazepines, and in particular the overprescription of these drugs, is one that you are already very aware of here at the ICGP. Yes, we've been aware of um, the issue around benzodiazepine prescribing for quite a number of years now. We have been educating, in particular, GPs uh, during their training and also practicing GPs around the best way to issue uh, prescriptions for patients who may require them, but also ways of not issuing prescriptions and looking at alternative ways of managing stress or anxiety um, in patients who present. What was the essence of the guidelines that you issued to GPs? Well, the essence of the guidelines really are to be very cautious around prescribing, because at that stage, um, and in fact for quite a bit before that, it was recognised that the issues around dependency and addiction that can accrue uh, with benzodiazepines and only in certain circumstances to prescribe when symptoms were very severe um, and if you did need to prescribe to only prescribe in the short term. We can't force doctors to practice in a particular way and you know all doctors um, would have to use their own clinical judgment in any given uh, consultation. So we can't, you know, as I said, force anybody not to prescribe, but we can certainly educate and advise um, on how best to do that. Another piece of it is around educating patients. And, and I would feel very strongly that one of the roles of the GP is to educate our patients. And so, you know, somebody may come in, and this would not be infrequent where, you know, a patient who's in distress, either through bereavement or, 
you know, family stresses or financial stresses would come in and request something to help, you know, a medication or maybe they're not sleeping. And, you know, having done an assessment with the patient, um, in many instances, medication would not be the right uh, approach to take. And I would feel that in that situation, it's our role as a GP to, to educate the patient as to what other um, solutions they might find or other ways of coping with the stress that they're, that they're under at the time. 95% of Irish benzodiazepine users get their medicines on prescription from a doctor. But what about the other 5%? Where do they get their drugs? Doodle had shocked me with stories of taxi driver benzo dealers, but most non-prescribed benzos are bought online. Curious to find out how easy that might be, I placed an order on what looked to be a Canadian website. If you intend to buy Xanax online cheap and legally, then it is desirable for you to know the following things. 12 cent a pill. 12 cent a pill. The low cost of downloadable sedation. But while women like me have benzos in our medicine cupboards, I was shaken to discover the scale of the benzo problem on the streets. The middle class mum at home who's gone to her doctor to get a prescription for Xanax will never identify no. with somebody if she's walking, say, down here. goes. I'm Maya Dunphy and at times in my life I've been anxious enough to take sedatives to help me cope with the stresses of daily life. Zip, 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 zip. I've always known that laughter is a stress buster but I never thought it could be turned into medicine until I met a Nuri woman who'd been through the stress of redundancy, unemployment and marriage breakdown and still thinks life's a hoot. It's a very dark time in my life and um, I lost everything. My home, my marriage, my car, my job, my identity, my role, all of that. But now on reflection it actually was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because there was lots of gifts in that challenging time and laughter yoga was one of those. When we laugh we release endorphins from our brains and endorphins are the happy hormone that makes us feel really good. So, so now you laugh full time? Now I laugh for a living. <laughs> my name is Maya. I'm a new giggler. I'm a new giggler, that was the induction mantra. But I'm not a new giggler, I'm an old cynic. I mean, surely you have to find something funny to genuinely laugh. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> ho, ho, ha, ha. <laughs> but here, the laughter came first, and just laughing at nothing made us laugh even more. This must be where they get the canned laughter for unfunny comedy shows. Powerful. I think it's really powerful. It's a positive way to deal with stress and have fun. Like I had reached a stage in my life, I'd done all the talk and therapies, 
but I got to the point where and I was actually sick listening to me talking about my problems and this was just lovely because I didn't have to share, I didn't have to talk about anything, I could just be and giggle and laugh and just be carefree. Oh, oh, ha, ha, ha. The next laughter exercise we're going to do is... It struck me that one of the things you don't do much of on benzos is laugh. You feel too numb to be giddy. People in your class are taking control of their stress and managing it before it ever becomes too big a problem where they have to go down any other route. It's impossible to think any negative thoughts in a state of laughter or to feel any negative emotions in our belly because that's where we store them um, when we laugh. So yeah, it's really, it's very simple but very powerful. You are the poster girl for laughter. <laughs> For the short time that I took benzos, I never for one minute thought I was taking the same drug as street drug users. Yet I was the very same drug. Alison, I had no idea that benzos were actually the biggest street drug oh, yeah. at the moment in Dublin. Yeah, huge, absolutely huge. The middle class mum at home who's gone to her doctor to get a prescription for Xanax will never identify no. with somebody if she's walking, say, down here and she sees somebody strung out to bits on a mixture of things. They just don't identify with those people because they have gone to their doctor and they have done it legally. So if someone has been on Xanax for three, four years, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's an addiction. Huge the problem. same way, maybe it wouldn't manifest itself the same way because you've got a roof over your head and you're not falling around yeah. the street, yeah. but it's the same addiction. You know, the secrecy of being at home and being a middle-class mom, these are functional addicts, mums and dads. You know, dads. So you see similarities, absolutely, from yeah. your perspective between someone on the street absolutely. who's an addict and someone who's sitting at home winding three kids and it, to all intents and purposes is still functioning perfectly yeah. well. But I mean, people are even taking them now if they have a hangover. You know, if you have a really bad hangover, take a couple of Xanax and life is good again. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. That's the <laughs> Where do we get these blues? No. See, you can get them anywhere. You can absolutely get them anywhere. That's the difference, like blues, yellows, simos, dollies. I mean, it's actually more difficult to come off the likes of Enzo, Xanax or Valium than it is to come off heroin. What? You can come off heroin in a week. Nobody tells you that when you're popping a few for a stressful day. No, but you see, that's the thing. You are going to the doctor and it's all above board and it's all official and it's all legal. So the, where's the problem? Have you ever taken Xanax? No. No. no, I haven't actually. I like to take a drink if I feel a bit stressed. Oh. But I'm not even a big drinker. Um, but no, and but I would know plenty of people now who would have a couple of them in their drawers or their cupboards at yeah. home. And I have been in situations where I have felt quite down and I felt a bit stressed. You know, I'm a working mum with two kids. And I have had people say to me, take a half of Xanax yeah. and it'll be grand. No, it's, it's something I never heard up until about maybe five or six years ago. Yeah. And then even if you were going on a, a long haul flight or you said you had a busy week, yeah. the amount of people go, well, yeah. take a Xanax, yes, take a Xanax. Yeah. And I wasn't yeah. quite sure what that even meant yeah. until I was stressed for our wedding, went to the doctor, and next thing I had a bag of them at home too. Yeah. I was like, brilliant. And they yeah. are, I mean, it's amazing when you take when they do, just all the edges come yes. off. Well, I've taken sleeping and tablets. I've taken a sleep tablet and I took Valium when I was sick a few years ago. And it is heaven. Yeah, you know, when you feel the effects of these, you can see how easy real. it would be. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just I... not real. So you'll often find people dealing sort of up here near the cathedral or back there near the theatre. And um, even now, middle of the day. Yeah, I mean, Asha, they're here from dawn. Remember, like, addicts don't really sleep that well. Yeah, it's not just a nighttime thing. They oh, wait, six yeah. o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> they wake up with the cravings in the post and they know that it's going to be another Groundhog Day. They have to get out there, they have to get money, they have to get their drugs. They know where to get them, they know who to get them from, and, you know, they'll take up to whatever they need that day. I mean, and there's I... overdoses all the time on the streets. It's part of being in addiction, particularly on the streets, but, you know, the next person is just waiting to get out and get their drugs, and that's yeah. it. HSE spend on antidepressant, anti-anxiety and antipsychotic drugs recently increased by 10% from 127 million euro in 2011 to 140 million euro in 2012. To tackle the problem of both overprescription and black market street use of benzos, the Minister of State for Primary Care, Alex White, is planning new legislation.
when my best girl reporter guys, I went to the ugliest building in Dublin to meet the minister. Alex, you have expressed concern about the health risks associated with long-term or inappropriate use of benzodiazepines, Xanax and, and drugs like that. There are problems associated as well with inappropriate use of medicines, overuse of medicines, and I think that's something that definitely does come up in the area of, of benzo benzodiazepines, or benzos as we call them, yeah. where people maybe use use them inappropriately, use them um, perhaps when they might be able to take other steps to address a problem that they have. Um, I mean, there is obviously a place for, for, for those kinds of drugs and doctors prescribe them for good reasons. So well, nobody is saying that, you know, there's a case for banning or prohibiting drugs that actually do have value and are actually important sometimes in, in people's treatment. But what we want to do is to get a more sensible approach to people's, uh, for people themselves, that they understand what they're doing maybe a little bit better, have more information. And in some cases, we do need stricter regulations. We need to have regulations, for example, to look at the, 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 the approach to prescription, like how long the prescription is valid for, for example. And we think it's appropriate that we should shorten that period. And maybe also reduce the quantity that can be prescribed. It was something that I wasn't hugely aware of until I was prescribed them myself. And they are amazing. I mean, Xanax, like you say, they have a place. Yes, they do. But I was never told that they could be addictive, that they can that you become so dependent on them. You know, when you put your finger on information that people are actually well informed, that they understand not just the, the potential and the value of a medicine for them, but also the risks that are associated with it. And bringing back to the legislation, Alex, will it, will it cover the problem, the growing problem with benzodiazepines on the street as well? Because it's now, I know, we don't see much connection between women like me and somebody on the street who appears to be you know, off their head for want of a better term. We are going to introduce also a, an offence um, for the possession of um, benzodiazepines without authorization, in other words, without a prescription. And how many so. would you have to have on you? <laughs> well, I mean, there are women I know who keep four or five in, in, their, in their bag. Would, well, I'm not that they'd be well, stopped. I mean, you know, the actual product, I mean, we know that benzos require prescription. So even a small quantity of benzodiazepines you're, it, it can only be dispensed on foot of prescription. So it will be an offence to to possess benzos without it being clear that you had authorization to have them, which is a prescription. And I actually think that's right, you know, that's because it is, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of people on, on you know, as you say, on the streets, and I know sometimes that term is a bit, is a bit, on, is a bit sort of uh, dismissive almost, but there are, people, there are people with huge drug problems. It's really alarming to hear of a drug like that that I've had in my cupboard and my friends yeah. still have in their cupboards. Yeah, yeah. To hear that in, this, in the same sentence as abuse and street use and possession, you know, the way we think of really serious drugs, it really puts them in the context that they, they should be mm. talked about in. Well, sometimes we don't make the connection. I mean, it's an interesting point because when we, sometimes when we use the word drugs, we think of drugs, we think immediately drugs, illicit drugs, heroin, cocaine. Um, but, you know, <laughs> Medicines are drugs, drugs are, you know, it just in the, same, in, the, in the same way. Two weeks ago, I placed an order for benzos online, but what arrived in the post wasn't a blister pack. It was a letter from the Irish Medicines Board who'd confiscated my order. John, I received a letter from the Irish Medicines Board saying that a package that I had ordered online had been detained. So now I feel like a bold child in the headmaster's office. And I'm looking at some of the drugs which have been detained here. So my tablets could be in that big bag. Well, if... if uh, I we've take one pack. If we, no, you cannot. <laughs> if we've advised you that your um, uh, pack has been detained uh, by customs and passed on to us, uh, then it's not in here. But uh, this, these are examples of uh, the, the kinds of amounts that, that we can detain. It runs from single packages to larger amounts. We have to keep saying to people, you don't know who is trying to supply these to you. They're certainly not interested in your health. But even with something like that, that has branding on it. So that's got to be a genuine product. Hasn't it? I mean, it's... It possibly is, uh, but again, it's an illegal route of supply. It's been supplied without any information. It's also supplied without a, a doctor's prescription, without the oversight from a doctor. But could that potentially be something else in that blister pack? Potentially. Uh, we are concerned overall about counterfeit and falsified products, and we have seen instances where um, well-known branded products have been counterfeited and are falsified where they intended for one market maybe re partially repackaged and, and sent to another market. So if I say I had a prescription for the drugs I'd ordered, 
would I be able to take them then? Uh, because uh, it's an illegal route of supply, we would say no to you, uh, that you could not have that product. Am I on an Interpol list somewhere now? Um, I think un un unlikely at, at this stage. Our concern, as I say, is with the supplier uh, to try to stop them if, if at all possible. I'm suitably chastened, John. Noticing the buttocks on the stool. I never intended to use my online purchase for any reason other than to make a point, because I was becoming more and more interested in finding alternative ways of managing my anxious tendencies. In Ennis County Clare, I met up with a group of women who are managing their stresses through mindfulness, with the odd zen shattering interruption. Are we a generation of people who are more stressed? I think the difference is that there's more social anxiety around sort of measuring up. If we could recognise that this is stress or this is anxiety, and if I have the, the knowledge or the understanding of what's happening, then I can do something about it. But of course, if I don't, I, the first thing I'm going to do is to visit the GP. And especially with the kind of lives we lead at times, you know, if it's something that's really pressing and that's causing me a lot of difficulty right now, then I'm going to be happy to take a Xanax to calm me down. So yeah. that's the problem, that it's the quick fix. Yeah, and but is mindfulness and that kind of meditation Okay, I mean, I'm not saying it has the same effect as a drug like Xanax, but does it have a similar effect? I it mean, has a very similar effect. The problem with it is that it doesn't happen overnight. It's a bit like learning to ride a bicycle. You know, you have a lot of false starts and it takes you a long time to actually get it. But when you do, it's totally reliable. We run off to the chemist or to the doctor, whereas a lot of the time, the nearest sort of pharmacy to us is inside our heads. I love that Different. term, the pharmacy in my head. We should all be aware of the pharmacy in our head. Absolutely. <laughs> Repeat prescriptions and it's all the cheaper. time. And yeah. Tabor, would you find life stressful on a day-to-day -day basis? It just can be a little bit challenging sometimes, I think, with a two and a half year old um, and then your husband and... That's even more stressful than a two and a half year old. Yeah, yeah. He, um, he wants what he wants when he wants it and trying to work around that can be a little bit yeah. stressful. I mean, Brida, do you feel pressure to look good and to be a perfect mum and to be all these things to all people? Everything can just can be so busy all the time. It's just like everything's crazy, crazy, crazy all day long. And sometimes I'd be just like, right, okay, take five minutes and just yeah. breathe. All of you have taken kind of control of any possible, I don't want to say mental health issues, but any possible stresses in your life by taking part in this. But it's recognising. You're recognising when you're stressed and when you're anxious and all that and it's kind of like thinking right okay this is okay yes I'm anxious but I can find a way around this you know rather than just letting it build it up and build up yeah. build up yeah. till it gets out of hand that's and you've lost control exactly. you know and that's, that's what the mindfulness yeah. does it stops you losing control of it yeah. it's mm -hmm. getting the control back or concentrating on what you're doing at that moment in time that's what I find good yeah. about the class yeah. Yeah. yeah just staying in the present staying in the present yeah focusing yeah and not worrying about next thing or worrying about the past I have met so many women, and I have been one of them, who has ended up relying on you know, things like Xanax or prescription drugs like that to deal with those days that you just feel you can't cope with. But it, it seems to me like you guys have almost avoided that by doing what you're doing. I'd like to think it does. Yeah, because it is, it's a, it's a real outlet, you know. So I'd like to think it would prevent that ever being an issue, you know. And it's worked for us, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and it's kept us sane. So, yeah. yeah, so it's good. <laughs> Here goes. When I was prescribed benzodiazepines, I was finding it hard to deal with anxiety caused by the stresses of a busy life. But I didn't realize how quickly the occasional pill can turn into a dangerous addiction. Now I've learned I need to look harder for other ways of reducing my stress and anxiety. If this feeling flows both ways, sort of hoping that you'd stay. Crawling back to you Never thought I'd 